Right Pack Radio is a podcast brought to you by Winding Trails Media for writers by writers. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things, now including audio dramas. I'm working on scripts for those. For Winding Trails Media, which I am the president of. I'm also president of St. Louis Writers Guild, and with me today is my lovely co-host... Kathleen Kayembe, paranormal romance writer and the pen name Kaseka and Vita, and soon to be leaving you for a number of weeks. Wow, well, but what are you leaving us for, though? There's something really exciting there. I'm going to Clarion in San Diego. It's a writing workshop for fantasy, horror, and sci-fi writers, and it's really good, and it's going to be amazing, and I'm going to come back fried from writing so much, and it's going to be great. <laughs> Yay! I want, your, I want your brain fried because that means you've been writing. Yes, I'm excited. I like you when you're writing. When you're not writing, you're very hard to live with. Yes. Yes, I am. And on that note, turns to about hard to live with. Hi, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, I am Brad Arcoke, author of such wonderful steampunk novels as The Iron Horseman and Iron Zulu. Uh, also check out my short story, which is available as an ebook now, A Clockwork Heart. Uh, you can find more at bradarcook.com. Uh, I am Bob Baker. I'm the author of 12 books. 11 of them are non-fiction on topics like music marketing, book promotion, and other topics for uh, creative entrepreneurs of all types. However, last year I did uh, release my first work of fiction called Unraveling the Book of Secrets. Yay. So we're going to be really eager to see what I have to contribute to today's discussion. <laughs> Excellent. And, Brett and Bob is leading off all the webinars and videos he does and so forth. And classes he teaches. And classes he teaches. Yeah, it's a little bit crazy. But uh, yeah, I got, there's audio books and online courses. And, and in fact, you, David, you're part of it, something that I'm doing right now called the 30 Day Passion Project Program, which yes. is for creative people to pick one uh, creative project that they've been putting off or they want to focus on and dedicate 30 days to doing a little something on it every day. In fact, that is exactly what I'm working on right now, which is one of the audio plays. Yay. Cool. I'm Melanie Claney, author of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction, and I am currently, it feels like I get halfway done and then half of the half and half of the half, but I'm closing in on the end of my first draft of an audio play, which will hopefully We'll only need two drafts, but we'll see. <laughs> and she's a scientist in the room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Jennifer Solzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. Uh, I also do book covers, oh, one of which I'm actually working on as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we believe in multitasking. Okay, today we're going to talk about, to borrow actually the headline straight from Writer's Digest, we're going to talk about bad guys and sleazy protagonists. Now, I don't know about anyone else here, but yes, I am not a Superman fan because he's just too darn clean. And what I mean by that is, he's even though I am a Boy Scout, he's too much of a Boy Scout at times. He's too perfect. Batman's like, cooler. Batman's much cooler. He's much darker. I like him better. I also like Panther and a few others that are darker. But why? What, what is the allure of the sleazy protagonist to you? And what allures us to bad guys that seem to stick around in our minds long after we've left either the TV show, the movie, or the, or the book? What? what do you mean by sleazy, exactly? Because uh, I'm picturing like a sketchy dude that makes women want to walk 50 feet away from him at all times. That would be one version. Okay, so what do you mean? Another sleazy version would be maybe a protagonist who... Um, I hate to put it as like an un, like a um, used car salesman type character, but I'll just throw it out there. Someone who you really don't think you can trust at all, um, but yet he's the good guy. So I think that's still on her level of the guy who you well, I, I want to feet away from. I'm not saying want to walk away from from car salesmen. I'm talking about the ones who you just don't feel like you can trust. Or how about this? 
How about a drug dealer? But who's actually an ex a protagonist, and that's kind of an interesting twist on things. Well, then there's okay. well, there's Dexter, but he's kind of likable. Okay, so but there, but he, 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 yeah. he's a, yeah. technically a sleazy or a bad guy protagonist. Well, and I think the the bad guy, but not necessarily sleazy. The issue is the word sleazy. Here. Right. Yeah. Sleazy is different than being uh, morally gray. I agree. Yeah. It's so, like you can be a very nice person who also just happens to be a serial killer. Yes. Well, yeah, really, really, this, um, really nice people. How about this? Before Kathleen jumps in, here's another example I can think of just off the top of my head. If anybody saw, unfortunately, NBC killed it after only one season. The Dra Dracula, which was set with Dracula as the protagonist, kind of almost steampunky type show. Yeah, the, pro the problem I saw with Dracula is there was nobody likable in that story, except for Mina. Which, the thing is, what Please. I've been trying to say is that we're trying to talk about protagonists the reader doesn't necessarily like. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's what they're aiming for. Chris Fries wrote this article on writersdigest.com, and Dave has already said the title. But from the gist of the article, it sounds like he wants to show people how to write, or she, I suppose wants to show people how to write protagonists that the reader's not going to feel great following necessarily, like people that you don't want to be around in real life. Or be questioning constantly the um, motive or the method of what they're doing. How about people, people who just, root for? How about people who just don't make the perfect decision all the time? Exactly. You know, there, are, there are some characters that I've rooted for very strongly who don't always make the best decisions. Now, I'm new to the fiction writing thing. Well, I've been dabbling in it for actually 12 years or more, <laughs> but finally published my, my first work, so I'm, I'm not as, uh, again, uh, uh, prolific in the fiction world. However, I, I think it's interesting that uh, quite often the best protagonists, protagonists have some kind of flaws, so they're not perfect, like you said, like, like Batman, I guess it's squeaky clean. No, Batman. Super, Superman. Super Superman is, you're right. right. Like Batman's got some darkness mm -hmm. to him. And the same thing with the bad guys, sometimes the uh, the antagonist in the story can have some good qualities and redeeming that you can relate to, yet he's the evil doer or whatever mm -hmm. in these stories. Is that, is that accurate to say? Is mm -hmm. that yeah. the case? Most, uh, most certainly. Yeah, it's part of, I think, making your characters all human. Um, Even when they're not human. Yes. Making them relatable in some fashion to the reader. No, I like your choice of word. That's why I was... Okay. Yeah, but on some level, I think the reason why we like these morally not perfect characters is because they can do things that we don't do in daily life. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons why you like Batman over Superman is because Batman will go around and punch the enemy out <laughs> and then throw him up against a wall and question him, whereas Superman's more going to, like, ask some weird questions. Turn them over to the police. Yeah, turn them over to the police. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> you know, or, you know, why we like some of the other, you know, kind of... Uh, not necessarily the nicest guys out there is because they're willing to do things that we as in our normal everyday lives can't do. Uh, like be a serial killer. <laughs> well, don't be that. So I think Dexter was a great example. Um, yeah, he's a guy who goes around killing other serial killers. So yeah, like in the article it basically is saying uh, it wants you to be able to humanize protagonists that people wouldn't like. So a serial killer, right off the bat, no. Serial killers are the ones that get caught. They're not the people you follow. They're not the ones that you root for. So how did they make Dexter more human and relatable? And how did they make Dexter someone you wanted to root for, even though he's a serial killer? Mm -hmm. Well, But he only killed bad guys. They gave him a code. He only kills bad people, like other serial killers. And he has a mental issue. You know, he has these impulses that we were framed very early on as saying things that he can't control. And we get to watch him struggle to, through those issues and try to be a better person. Now he's still a killer. He's still the person that a hero in another story would hunt down. Mm -hmm. But for our story, since he is our protagonist, the journey we're on with him is to see how bad he could be and as he tries to fight within the limitations of himself to be his best person. Like he's a good guy because he's trying to be a good guy. Just because that good guy he can accomplish isn't Superman uh -huh. doesn't mean he's not the hero of his story. Another character, he's not a serial killer. <laughs> you can argue, you can argue that. that. You can argue that, but he's also 
in the same lines. He has this code and so forth. I'm going to talk about Vic Mackey from The Shield. I don't know if anybody ever watched it here or saw it. The Shield, um, Vic Mackey was played by Michael Chiklis, who we might know from other roles he's played. The Thing. The Thing, mm -hmm. yes, from Fantastic By Four. the way, real quick, before you jump into this, there's a great robot chicken where they flip the thing in Vic Mackey. It's hilarious. <laughs> okay, I've now got to look this up because I'm picturing that, and that's just spooky as heck. But Vic Mackey, he's in charge of a basically an assault team, a strike team that goes off against drug dealers. And he's got four people on his team, and really all four of them are corrupt cops. If you ever look at the um, show's logo, it has a broken shield. But throughout the entire season, you have um, Vic Mackey and his team basically operating within a certain cove that they're living by. And they are good guys in the sense of the protagonist of the story, and they do do some good, don't get me wrong. But they really cross the line, and you see how wrong that things can go. Well, I mean, Big Mackey's kind of a long line of uh, yes. badass cops. Mm -hmm. uh, starting, I guess, like the 70s was just filled with them, like Dirty Harry, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of a whole long, you know, Serpico. Shaft? And Shaft. And, uh, you know, you, you, the, 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 I can't remember his name, the guy from the... Uh, Charles Bronson was the actor who played him in all those movies. Oh, yes. Um, uh, Death Wish and all yeah, that. Yeah, Death Wish movies. You yes. don't have to have a name. Just Charles Bronson. <laughs> Charles yeah. Bronson. Any Bronson. character Charles Bronson's ever played, basically. Yes. But yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, like, you know, Vic Mackey's kind of in that long line of these. And I think the reason why we like that is that sense of, you know, as I was saying, these cops who can do things that real cops can't do. You know, real cops have to have evidence and subpoenas <laughs> and you know they have like a bunch of laws they have to follow mm -hmm. but I think we all want the guy who can just kind of you know throw the criminals up against the wall and shoot them right <laughs> I mean Dirty Harry that's I mean he literally goes around killing everybody that he's supposed to arrest we like them in in media mm -hmm. we like yes. them in media because in media when they say this is the bad guy look at him shoot this person for disobeying him and we say oh I feel morally justified for wanting this guy to die uh, as opposed to real life where every human being is a shade of grey yeah, and fun. we probably shouldn't have cops that are vigilantes no, <laughs> no we live in that era now yeah, it's bad. It's a bad thing also too though sometimes we don't like what they do We don't even, even though we know the bad guy has done something totally horrendous maybe we sometimes sit back and question, hey, is he going too far? <laughs> um, what about 24, Jack? Um, Bauer. Bauer. Thank you. I almost called it Brewer. I'm like, I, almost said, I almost thought Reacher. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Jack, Jack Reacher. Reacher another another one. One, yeah. yeah. So let me ask you, everybody. When you create your protagonist or your bad guy, um, how do you go about it? I know the uh, article we've got is an exercise, and Kathleen name really wants to go through that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think eating dogs is really much, you know. Yeah. Hey, the point, the point. Okay. Yeah. We should do the exercise now, then, since you brought up part of it. Before we do, I do give a webinar on writing villains, a multi-layered villain called Inside the Heart of Darkness, which by the time this airs, it should be recorded, and I'll be putting it somewhere where you'll be able to access it. But one of the things that I do in it is I remind that remind the author that really the villain is extremely necessary to your story. An antagonist is different than a villain. I think that's one thing I'm going to point out right now. If Brad and I both wanted a soda, which I can't drink, but we'll say we both wanted a soda and there's only one left, well, we're both going to do something. That doesn't make Brad a bad guy or me a bad guy. It just makes us antagonists to each other. No, when I fry and pan you in the head, that makes That's me made, That turns you slightly into a villain. <laughs> when you launch a plan to steal every soda in the planet. There you go. <laughs> that makes but you a super villain. Super villain. Yes. And in all honesty, though, the villain has to be necessary to the hero. Uh, we just joked about super villains. Take a look. Let's do Lex Luthor and Superman for a second. Lex Luthor is supposed to be the greatest of all humans, but on top of the food chain, if you will, of mankind. He's created himself as a Machiavellian slash Nietzschean Superman, depending on which version you're looking at. But he's got to look up at Clark Kent slash Superman. And Just so Superman. He doesn't. He looks down on Clark Kent very much. Yes. Well, I mean, but physically, I'm talking <laughs> about. But Superman makes him feel inadequate. 
Right, exactly. But he's, a, he's is actually a mirror image of Superman in a lot of ways, where Superman could have gone wrong if he had gone bad. Um, let's play Batman for a second. Batman and Penguin. Penguin's a reflection of Batman of Bruce Wayne's money. What he could yeah. have done wrong with that. Oslo Riddler. Oslo Cal yeah. Um, the Riddler, Enigma, um, is the detective version of Batman. The wanting to solve the puzzles or wanting the puzzles solved. The Joker. He's just Batman. Batman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He is, yeah. I could go on forever about how awesome the Joker is. Yes. It's but the it's contrast of order to chaos. Very much so. Ooh. They're and both how insane. Can't live each other. Well, they're both crazy men, and technically, <laughs> Batman should probably also be in Arkham Asylum, except he's fighting for the good side, the good side, right. the order side. Uh -huh. But both of them have an ideology that is extremely deeply rooted in them. They both are mad to a point, pursuing that ideology. I mean, Batman dresses in a in a pajama costume and <laughs> kicks people from the sky. And the uh, Joker dresses in a clown costume and launches elaborate jokes. Yes. Uh, they're both very similar, except that the Joker wants to prove to Batman and the whole world that order is pointless and chaos is the natural state of things. And Batman is there to punch him in the face and say, No, order will, will reign over your chaos every time, but the Joker's still laughing at him because he knows this is temporary and he's going to break out of Arkham Asylum again and start chaos over because that's the natural state of things. It's great. <laughs> so I know a lot of the uh, examples that you're using are like clearly defined either antagonists or villains, uh -huh. and they're identified throughout the story. Um, I'm, I'm realizing that the, the book that I published, The Unraveling the Book, is... Secrets, um, you don't actually like know the identity of the villain or the antagonist till towards the end. You see the uh, the effects, like the to, to Bob, you know, they say right what you know, and so my pro my main point of view character in this is a is a is a journalist in St. Louis. He's assigned to do a story about this rock singer. Okay. She's a gorgeous girl. They have a little bit of a, a romantic thing going, and but there's someone who's chasing her, and he gets involved in this crazy. Adventure, but you don't know who it is, or it's like it's un it slowly unravels who it is, and it ends up being a character that you meet along the way. But hopefully, it's kind of a surprise that it's that person. So I don't know—is that a different category of antagonist, like the mystery yeah. antagonist or villain? That's a different story structure. This is yeah, exactly. This is a different story structure, but really, the construction of that villain is pretty much the same. Yeah. But see, if that villain were the main character, mm -hmm. then you get a different story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what the article's aiming at. So yeah, having your villain as a main character. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, every villain thinks so they're the main character of their own story. story. They're the I'm hero. Read part of this introduction, and then we're gonna do an exercise because I want us to make someone that's genuinely not a great person to want to be behind the wheel with. Okay, go for All it. Right. So, make me go along with the madness. When writing any genre, the character that takes center stage and often most of the beginning writer's attention is a likable protagonist. It is really difficult to write believable and page-turning, unlikable protagonists because they can become unpredictable. If they are to be redeemed, the payoff must be convincing and hard to achieve. Although, there are many authors who have tried it and done it well. Think Lolita. Hmm. How do you do it and keep the reader interested? How do you make it original? Try this exercise recommended for writers of all stages by Alyssa Nutting, the author, the debut author of Tampa, a novel told in the compelling voice of the sociopathic sexual predator, Celeste Price. So this exercise has five steps. So our first step is to create a character physically, male or female, something else entirely. How old are they? Their example is Mina is 60, is a 63 year old woman. Okay. So do you want us to share right now? Or do you yep. Okay. We're all just going to do this together. I'm going to borrow one from the story I'm working on then. Mm -hmm. She's female. Mm -hmm. Real age, 600 plus years old. Let's not make this too complicated now. <laughs> no, sorry. I'm just, I, I know her details. All right, what's her name? Um, what's again, the name again, she uses? Correctly. You would do just that, come up with a fake name. No, what's her uh, alias for this exercise? Katarina Kasalova. Katarina Kasalova? Yeah, she's Slavic. All right. Katarina Kasalova is 800 years old. 600 years old. Does old she does look she like look? she's 600? Yeah. She looks like she's in her late 20s. All right, so mm. Katarina is in her late 20s for the purposes of this exercise. Create your character's fetish, the weirder the better. Example, Mina, the 63-year-old woman, likes to eat dogs. Wow. 
unlikable, guys. Unlikable. Not just anti-heroic. Unlikable. That's kind of an instant not like you, too, because yeah. dogs are supposed to survive stories. I've oh. had, I, I heard someone thought that uh, my dog was ugly, and they instantly lost points on the friend meter. <laughs> <laughs> Eating them is going to a level that yeah. is is serious business. Alright, so we want they, someone... If they ate cats, would that be different? <laughs> no, no, no. More like no, it, no, 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 Alright, so Katarina, like... <laughs> The woman who came up with this exercise used a sexual predator who's a sociopath. Mm-hmm. So, something unlikable. What, if you learned something about this person, what would you learn about them that would make you instantly dislike them? Ah. Okay. So, uh, Katarina, 600 years old. Uh, she eats babies. She eats babies? Which, which, babies? Is slight, it, which is slightly higher up than eating dogs, by the way. Yeah. Human babies? Yep. Okay. Okay, so now she, right, this this she enjoys human veal. All right, so she's a cannibal, and she prefers uh, the veal. The version. young, yes. yes. So, all right. <laughs> this Katarina Thank you for eats the human babies. Veal. Now I'm just seeing babies locked in little boxes. Okay. You gotta make them real bad. <laughs> Create where your character lives. For example, she lives in a rundown part of the big city where there are always trash and leftovers lying around for stray dogs to find. She won't hurt someone's pet though; just the ones no one wants or are uncared for. You're next, anyway. Cool boy. She lives within 100 miles of an elementary school. Or with, within 100 feet of an elementary school. That's why she works in the daycare. She lives on a daycare. Yeah, the hospital. And yeah, she's anywhere. constantly struggling between her watering mouth and the knowledge that those children have families. Can she live close to the daycare? No. Wow. Okay. No, Where she works, anymore. sure. Because she likes little babies most, right? Sure. That was for an elementary we're, school. We're a human veal still, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So she lives really close to a school where they have little kids. Little wow. kids. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, but that's kind of hard to pull from. Maternity ward, kids die all the time. <laughs> Maybe she works in a hospital. Exactly. Mm, the serial killing nurse. Like, that's never been done before. Yeah, no. She's, right. well, just call the story SIDS, and that'll explain everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. Sudden infant death syndrome. I'd like to apologize for how dark we've gone at the moment. Well, Actually, we welcome to our world. Yes. All right, so four. What would your character buy or browse for in Kmart? Substitute Walmart, Kroger, Mayer is needed. For Baby example, shoes. She loves the pet section. She buys dog biscuits, dog food, dog toys, dog beds, anything to coax them to her. So what baby shoes. Uh, baby shoes all the time. Yeah. Do you need to get baby shoes if they you're going to really them? Adorable. No, they're adorable. <laughs> Ever, anything made like the little baby clothes that look like grown-up clothes, but they're just very tiny. She also likes doll clothes and little little doll size. She collects things. dolls. That's it. I think no, dolls totally, are creepy anyway. I, I think she totally gets baby formula because she likes to fatten them up like the witch in Hansel and Gretel. Before oh, she, she takes eats care them. of them before she eats them. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. Well, That's just some. No, babies scream. Kill that fast. <laughs> Maybe well, she keeps them sedated. Oh, she yeah. works in a hospital. Maybe she keeps them sedated. <laughs> All right. That's the pizza. Yeah. Five. <laughs> create an event this. that upsets the character's equilibrium. Basically, create the catalyst for the character's motive. For example, she accidentally eats her neighbor's pet and she suspects that person knows. Or, for another example, the animal shelter or the pound starts rescuing dogs from her street. The point of this is to create a memorable character and set up the moment where things go awry. Well, we keep putting uh, this character into modern day, mm-hmm. but the reality is, if you pulled it back, I'm thinking of the Countess Bathory here, who Ooh, used to invite people. You know, lady. she'd invite young virgins uh-huh. to her castle, and then she would carve them up and bathe them in their blood. So, you know, if you're going to do the baby snatching thing, this would actually be really easy up until. She could be a midwife and take care of babies that women didn't want. She's the one you always call when your baby needs to die. But then she's performing a kind of service. No, hey, hey, there's our twist. There's our our Dexter-esque twist. She's a midwife, and she she helps to uh, feed this need to eat babies by only eating the stillborn babies. Oh, God. Good one. As a midwife. So she's trying her best to not be as terrible as she is. Really Do you think she gives people <laughs> drugs that would help make the babies? Maybe help make the babies? Still she's very more. patient if she's going like, to let them cook for nine like, You know how you know, large she the infant mortality rate was that? Like with Rapunzel? Old, okay, so the story of Rapunzel. I don't know. The but Rapunzel plants <laughs> used to actually be used 
by women for abortion purposes. So when this woman has her husband go get her Rapunzel, it's kind of saying, I don't want to have this baby. So when the witch takes the baby away, she's basically done the woman the service that wanting the Rapunzel in the first place kind of signifies. So what if this woman just, you know, helps women not have babies and then she eats them? Because they're tasty. Okay, but then what's the conflict? Yeah. She accidentally uh, takes a baby she should not have, and yeah. the father turns it out to be terribly rich and terribly in need of an heir and terribly angry. And so the baby goes to save the baby. But the baby may not be alive anymore. Well, that would be the tragic end. And then people the find happy out what she would does. Be that they, the family saves the baby and they live happily ever after. But our bad character is supposed to be our protagonist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. How about how well, about this yeah, one? Yeah, she's running away from the you know scary villagers who are trying to get. Her. How about this idea? What if our main character is a midwife, and she either kills babies to eat them or she eats babies that are already dead. Either way, she likes eating baby flesh. It's very. Uh, <laughs> It's it's her Thank thing you. she does. Well, that's how she maintains her youth. Uh, oh, well, um, but the she doesn't yeah, kill. She doesn't. She she likes the corpses of babies because they aren't quote unquote alive yet to her. Like she doesn't see them as living creatures. But she gives one the drug to kill it and brings it home, but it doesn't work and it's actually alive. And once the baby starts crying, suddenly she realizes she has to adopt it because it gains. Uh, like pet status in her head, just like a dog to this woman in the story uh, on in the exercise. Uh, she doesn't eat her neighbor's dogs because her neighbor's dogs have value because they belong to her neighbors. But stray dogs have no value; they don't belong to anyone. So she'll eat them. This baby had no value until it started wanting things, <laughs> and when it started wanting things, suddenly she had to give it stuff. And when she's taking care of it. Now she has to balance this, I eat babies, but I'm looking after a baby and developing emotions for said baby. Now, this actually reminds me of a fantasy story where, you know, they took the baby, but the baby was too small to eat, so they went around to fatten it up, and by the time it got big enough to eat, that you didn't want to eat it anymore. Oh. And technically, also, too, this type of story is also found in Greek mythology with Kronos, but was, okay, go ahead, and then I want to say something, go ahead. There is a story uh, by Sarah Rees Brennan, I believe there may be another author, I'm not sure. Sarah Rees Brennan, it's called Teen Human, and in it, uh, it's basically like the best friend of the person whose friend is Bella from Twilight falling in love with a vampire, you're like, what are you thinking? Mm-hmm. So it's from that person's point of view. But she meets a human boy who was raised by vampires, and his name is Kit, and you find out it's short for Kitten because the vampires were supposed to eat him when his parents left him on their doorstep, and they were like, we'll have a pet, and then he started growing, and he became family, and they were like, his name is Kitten, though. <laughs> One of the things, um, as I say, that this exercise leaves out is asking questions like, why is this person the way they are? What's driving them? And the second question is, how... How do they see their own evil? Well, how, how are they looking inside themselves? The first one um, would be a question for everybody here as we created this character, this very disgusting character, but this character, what makes her have to eat babies? Why does she want to eat To maintain babies? her youth. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Okay, <laughs> she so, is 600. So, yeah. so, that's, so that's how she, uh, she, 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 she maintains that cells. looking in their 20s, and then when she adopts this baby, maybe she she swears off eating babies, period, and then she starts aging, and she has to deal with the aging She freaks out. Project. Yeah, exactly. process. Finds she's a gray hair and is like, what is I this? gotta eat a baby. Oh, wait, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> well, and then what, is the how does she said? see herself when she looks in the mirror more? I don't mean the physical part of it. But yeah, because she might not have a reflection, you know, right. just well, saying. <laughs> but how does she see herself? Does she see herself as justified in being able to eat babies because she's the top of the food list? Is she morally, morally repulsed at her own self 
Yeah, but that depends on what kind of character you want. Mm -hmm. I agree. If so you want a character continue. who hates themselves, then obviously she's repulsed by what she does. Mm -hmm. If you want a character that glorifies themselves, then, you know... I like the concept of this of our character we've written being repulsed by herself, but addicted to the, the life, the extended life and the beauty, and trying to decide if she's, like... She, as she's getting older, she's freaking out because she knows she's dying. Even if she's only gotten older by a week and a half and suddenly she has one laugh line. It's one sign of her mortality that she now has. And she has to decide if living forever is worth compromising this moral, you know, now we have a baby we care about. Whereas before it didn't feel so bad. You know, it's I could justify really, that kind of really thing. And it's a vampire story. But like, if yeah. the babies are already dead, though, I don't... I don't know. Well, maybe that's the limit. maybe it's, that's it's the compromise like, she comes up with. If mm. she's if she's so long lived, she's got to be somewhat of the thought. Humans come and go. Mm -hmm. I last. Humans come and go. What is the point and of getting a, to know everyone? Okay, so the trope of the immortal story. Right. So Brad's on about about forever with that trope. You talk about glorifying it themselves. How would the, the question is on that side? I loved how Jennifer went down the other side, and I'm going to leave it alone. Because she, she took it right where I was going to go. Mm -hmm. The glorification was, how is she glorifying herself with well, eating these babies? instantly, I think, uh, Akasha from... Uh, Queen of the Damned. Queen of the Damned, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Ian Rice. You know, who looked upon mortals as just food mm -hmm. and had no problems eating the entire island mm -hmm. because, you know, she was hungry that day and wanted to do it. So... You know, like, if you're going to glorify it, then, you know, they become a deity almost above, you know, said humans. Perfect. You know. And, you know, what if eating the babies, well, that's secondary. What she really needs is their souls to stay young. So that might, that's the perfect reason why the dead babies wouldn't work. So. Why does it have to be shame or glory? Can't she be indifferent to eating babies? I feel Can't like be. there's that whole middle road mm -hmm. of kind of sociality. Walter White. Walter White from Breaking Bad was indifferent to what he was doing. He had cancer, he was ticked off, yes, but, you know, really it was about fortune and, you know, making money and... You business. Know, right. Business, yeah, it became a business. Because, like, the thing is, That's not when a lion it. eats a gazelle, is it going to feel guilty or it like doesn't. it's the bestest thing no, ever? I saw because it yeah, that's no, I saw. It's dessert. just nature. It's just I had a killing something day, to eat. And I in no way, shape, or form feel bad about eating that cheeseburger. So, I'm like for an immortal pizza. who feeds on babies in particular, yeah. what if for her it's just this is what my food is? Yeah. The other way of taking it is it's a drug. And then you do the common drug trope of. You know, I have to do this in order to satiate my next fix. Except then the food becomes a person, like Kitten in the story, and yeah. like this baby that she takes in that suddenly starts screaming. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're stepping into the mental side of the bad guy, the, the darkness inside. Indifference is perfect. That's another great... She's story. our protagonist. She's not the bad guy. Yeah, okay, but we're still stepping inside of her own darkness. Yes. I think yeah. we've successfully made a character that all of us have had a lot of fun exploring what her story is about, mm -hmm. which is what writing is, is picking a character and then wanting to explore their story and how they change through the experiences that they had. And I think it kind of also shows that you can start with someone with some very unlikable qualities and begin to feel for them in some fashion. Yeah, I was just thinking, well, yeah, if you're reading the story, the babies can be symbolic of all, but I can imagine a vegan writing the story. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> beyond that, there's a old saying, I have no idea who said it, and I'm going to misquote it, but all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own unique way. I think in a lot of ways there's a lot more freedom when you're dealing with bad guys or dark characters because you don't assume that the standard rules of morality apply to them. Uh -huh. And they can, a lot of bad guys do have a code. And I think bad guys with the code are often very interesting, but their code doesn't have to be society's code. Yeah, and that's why we like them, because they can do things we can't do. Right. You know, the, the reason exactly what you're saying, why bad characters are sometimes more fun to play with is mm -hmm. they have a wider range of things they can do than the narrow good character. You know, when you're dealing with somebody who's a good person or a good, you know, they have kind of a structure they have to follow, and unfortunately they have to maintain it. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, you know, but if, it, if you go aside from that, 
suddenly there's a whole world of possibilities that opens up, including walking the straight and narrow. Um, I'm going to draw a, an example, sort of parallel, sort of uh, illustration, to explain this concept uh, based on a, a very different thing. When you're looking for names for characters, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you go to babynames.com, <laughs> And no. you try. Oh, no, I and have been tra- uh, tagged as pregnant so often because of my visits there. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. When you go to baby names, yes. when you go to babynames.com and you look up a, char- a name that you want to name a character. Mm-hmm. When you search that site for something that means sadness or loss or any negative emotion, they don't list those meanings for those names because no one wants to quote unquote name their baby, you know. A ruin of civil- civilization or something, right. um, but uh, those it does have those meanings. It's just that you're kind of taking your character when you make them good, make them like your default good character. Uh, you're taking away all those options for how they could be. Could they be the destroyer of civilizations? They could. You just have to write a story of a human who does that. Perhaps that name means both sadness and loss and joy in finding because it's about a whole story of a whole person but on babynames.com and also in the sort of vanilla good guy trope land where your protagonist has to be a a generically good person and can only make altruistic choices you're eliminating half the meaning of that character just just as an illustration Also, too, that, that's a great illustration. Mm-hmm. The other thing you can do, too, is you can create a character, name the character something that is the antithesis of what it is. I'm going to use a good person, I'm going to use a good girl for this, because it's one of Joss Whedon's characters, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Buffy. How many people want to, would think that they would ever want to be killed and could live down, preferably live down, being killed by somebody named Buffy? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like there's a trope out there for people who game. Instead of naming your naming your found magical item uh, Dragon Slayer, name it Fluffy Bunny. Nobody can live it down. So you can have you can play with that. You can play with a joke or a con. Or a con this is my mighty sword, Fluffy Bunny. Yes, dude. How much more terrible would it be to be slain by a sword named Fluffy Bunny, though? Exactly. Like that's humiliating. <laughs> And also kind of fun as a writer when you make characters seem innocuous or things seem innocuous that are really dangerous, then the other characters never see it coming, and it's beautiful in a terrible sort of author way. Though, if I'm actually reading a cool book and suddenly the mighty sword is named Fluffy Bunny, I think I'm going to stop taking it seriously for a while. Yeah, so that has to be lampshaded. <laughs> there's there's a, a short story novella by Megan Durr. I can't remember the name of it. It might have been Jewels of... Uh, whatever. Um, but in it is a demon. Like, wicked, powerful demon. Literally okay. wicked, literally powerful, also literally demon. Mm-hmm. And the main character feels this powerful, evil presence come into his establishment and he goes to see who could possibly be bringing that much power into this house of his and it's a it's a kid it's like a little teenage boy who looks you know like a little cherub Mm -hmm. and then this kid smiles and it's the creepiest most terrible thing ever because you know exactly how dangerous he is and that he likes it and he's like why did you choose this body because demons can choose different bodies and he's like it's not scary in this body. Nobody is scared of me in this body. And then when I show them how powerful I am, it hurts them way worse. They underestimate me. This is a common trope, and it's actually something I kind of enjoy, and children are often used because of this. Uh, Like, dude, Mm -hmm. dude, well, dude. Uh, The most powerful being is a tiny little girl. And it's because she had, you know, for different reasons, but, you know, she was still in her mom's belly when she took the uh, water of life. But because of that, Everybody treats her differently, and it's, you know, a whole thing that kind of gets pulled up. Uh, I'm thinking also of uh, the kids with the hockey sticks who run around in uh, Dogma. Uh, You know, because, and they're used as, like, the little demons, you know, uh, minions. 
and why? Because you know kids are anal sex. Right? <laughs> because it's kids a are innocent. That you look at, but one of the ones I love doing this too is uh, I can't think of his name. I was trying to and Spawn, uh, Malboja's like demon that goes between Spawn and Malboja. The de- the devil is a clown. He's a nasty, disgusting clown, but he's a clown, mm-hmm. and it's to off put you. It's to throw you off it's for the same reason. So. Having that kind of flip on that, that maybe you're bad guy, is kind of a good thing. To be, be fair, really a lot of people are scared of clowns. Scouts are, clowns are scary things, yes. I'm thinking about this uh, book called Let Me In. It was made into a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm not sure, I think in the original language the book was in, and then in the U.S. Mm-hmm. It might be Let the Right One In, and then the U.S. version is Let Me In. Um, but that book, nobody's really likable. Like, it was really hard for me to read that book. I read it for class. Um, and the main character's not likable. He's an angry he's an angry child. All the other characters whose eyes you see through over the course of the book are also unlikable. One of them's a pedophile. Like, uh-huh. it's just a lot of people who you're like, Batman could punch these people in the face and I would cheer. That, that kind of cast. How do you, as a writer, like, we humanized Cat, the midwife who eats babies mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Like, now she's a sympathetic character to me. Same as Dexter is a sympathetic character to me. And Sherlock from BBC Sherlock is sympathetic to me. How do you write a story in which you've humanized a character that is unlikable, but not made them actually likable? How do you do that? Um, uh... I've been watching a whole lot of Columbo recently, <laughs> and there's an episode of Columbo, I don't remember what the title was, it was the one with Dick Van Dyke in it, okay. and at the beginning, I was noting this as I was watching it, uh, the, the formula of Columbo is that they show you the murder first thing, and then you watch Columbo pin the murder on the guy who did it. Um, Dick Van Dyke murdered his wife. <laughs> And he murdered his wife, but I found myself, as I was watching it, I wanted her to die, too. Because she was uh, shrewish and demanding, and he wanted, you know, he was, he thought, he is acting, because Dick Van Dyke's a good actor. Uh, he felt like he was, he'd put up with this woman that she refused to let him live his life, he was stifled. Uh, she was spending all of his money on stuff she wanted to do. He really wanted this ranch house. It's the only thing I want. Will you please come look at it? And she says, I'll look at it, but I'll hate it. I'll just go because you want me to, but we have to get back in time for this auction because I want to spend all this money on this expensive tea set. And I'm like, oh, this woman's awful. So then when he killed that woman, I was like, well, the, you know, I wasn't, oh my gosh, the poor woman. There's other episodes of the show when the murderer kills his victim. I'm like, no, but he was so nice. Or, no, but he, was, he had that uh, little kid who loved him or something like that. But this woman, I was not sad to see go. She was framed very, very negatively. And that made me sympathetic for Dick Van Dyke the murderer. Now, I'm like, this is an interesting episode. Because are we going to feel bad when he gets caught, when Columbo hunts him down? Not too long after... We find out that Dick Van Dyke has framed this poor ex-con who just got out of jail. He, can, he doesn't have a driver's license, and he's so grateful to Dick Van Dyke for giving him a job. No one else would give him a chance. He just wants to get back on his feet. He went into jail for extortion. You know, it's like, this is, this is my chance to come back. And he frames him, and then he shoots him in cold blood and leaves his body in the sun and escapes. And then I wanted to catch... <laughs> Dick Van Dyke because he took advantage of someone that was innocent quote unquote I mean even he was a, con- a convict but I had sympathy for the convict because I wanted him to succeed I had sympathy for Dick Van Dyke because I wanted him to succeed when he killed his wife that when it changed was when he then used his power for evil this is why everyone loves Game of Thrones mm-hmm. <laughs> because George R. R. Martin has perfected this <laughs> There are very few characters on Game of Thrones, with the exception of a few of the Starks, mm-hmm. that everyone, and to be honest, the only one characters that everyone really loves are the Dire Wolves, and they get killed off so often it's not even funny. <laughs> I can hear a little bit of bitterness in your There's voice. There's huge bitterness. I hate summer time now because they killed summer recently. Anyway, mm. uh, point Whoa. being, though, that 
you have these characters like Joffrey, who is a horrible little kid mm -hmm. who becomes king and is the most wretched character ever. And then he gets killed. And it's a beautiful thing, and you love it. <laughs> um, and, you know, the point is is that, like, there are so many characters on this show who are just despicable. And some of them remain, but the beautiful thing about George R. R. Martin is you know that everyone's going to die. <laughs> Everyone is going to die. No one is safe. They do that from the very beginning where the lead character who you think is the lead character is killed off in the very first season. Everyone's like, whoa, I didn't expect that, except it was Sean Bean. <laughs> so that made sense. But the Poor point casting is, is that, you know, for yes, exactly. Just by being the actor, you know, oh, he's going to die. Uh, though, actually, uh, I was just watching a movie and he didn't die. And I was like, whoa, wait. Was it the first Silent Hill movie? No, it was The Martian. <laughs> I was like, how are they going to kill Sean Bean in this? And then he survived. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> but anyway, you know, this is this is a thing where you can do that, where you can kind of like create these characters that you want to die, or create characters who are so despicable that you want them to die. It's an interesting thing. But George R. is great at it. Uh, my comments about something else, if you wanna, anyone wants to talk about Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, no, mine is a different thing too. Okay, I was just thinking about a novel I was assigned in 11th grade, Native Son. And in that one, uh, I'm not a bigger Thompson. I'm not sure if I have the name right, but in any case, the main character is a murderer, and he's um, most people are very sympathetic. He, the white woman he kills, is pretty much accidental. Frankly, it would be manslaughter at most if it, we were living in fair times. But then, in his subsequent whatevers, he ends up killing his girlfriend, and it's just. Yeah, he was very psycho. Well, yeah, you could. You, you still empathized with him, but one of the discussing questions in class is like, yeah, he didn't really deserve to die for X, but because he killed what her name, you know, he did deserve to die. Um, I was going to bring it to a different track, so if anybody wants to comment. Actually, I was waiting to, to bring a different track because I'm going to see where you go and then we'll see. Well, Jennifer brought up an interesting point in talking about that episode of Columbo. Mm -hmm. So we start out with a character who has done something unthinkable, has committed murder. Then we learn to sympathize with them because of who they murdered and the circumstances surrounding that. Because we understood how he felt mm -hmm. and why he thought that murder was a good solution to the problem he had. Mm -hmm. And then we stop sympathizing with him when we find out he basically frames an innocent party for his crime so he can get away with this life and then he shoots that party in cold blood mm -hmm. so we stop sympathizing with him because we don't sympathize with his the, there's the justice line became moved mm -hmm. you know like the first murder it kind of felt just the second murder was not at all. Mm -hmm. It was completely selfish in a way that did not feel like justice. So maybe taking that character as an example, how do you redeem someone who is unlikable? How do you redeem an unlikable protagonist after the reader's been with them through these actions that are reprehensible? You make them make Beth. You make them feel guilty. That's one way. <laughs> they try to do good deeds after they realize that they've been on the wrong yeah, watching, That's part of feeling guilty. Yeah. Uh, the point is uh, that you have to um, make them, you have to make your character who is done, who's morally gray lean more toward the light side than the dark side. Like, you understand why they did it or how they did it, and you get to see them realize that the choices they made probably weren't the best choices to make. Uh, well, having them co try make you know efforts to redeem themselves go a long way. Like Scrooge. Like Scrooge. Yeah. Scrooge is a terrible well, person. Yeah. Well, another a different track would be to find out that they had better motives than you thought, that they were really going for the greater good, and whether or not you agree with that action or not, 
let's say instead of killing that guy to frame him for the crime, well, fine, but he was really a secret agent, and that was necessary so we could stop the terrorist. Well, the thing you is, know. you want them to still be unlikable. You want it to actually be a change in the character that you, you need to make convincing somehow. Yeah, because I would almost say it does a disservice to take this cool, taking the Dick Van Dyke character mm -hmm. and suddenly making him a nice guy where he's jumping around with Mary Poppins now. Yeah, <laughs> no. You know, like, that, that would not be the flip I'd want. I no. would want... You know, a redemption maybe for having killed the not so innocent convict, you know, yeah. or something like that. It could be mm -hmm. that maybe that guy was a pedophile, it turns out. Mm -hmm. And you find this out, you know, so killing the convict in the end becomes a justifiable. I. Yet but again, that's not falling changing the justice. character. No. no. That's changing that's a twist the, in the story. action. I want to know how you redeem a character, how but you can make a character. Yeah. I don't Do know you if want I want to redeem. I just asked the question because yeah. I want to know. The way you redeem Dick Van Dyke's character in that story is if he realizes uh, when he's, he's framed this guy and killed this guy and uh, he realizes that what he's done like he, was, he killed his wife and he's like killing is the answer and he solves the problem and he realizes that he has become a monster and turns himself in. The, the minute he turns himself in, you go, oh, well, he wasn't that bad after all. Because even though he did a bad thing, the bad thing, oh, it was uh, he felt uh, trapped by his wife, so he killed his wife to get out of it. But he didn't want to go to jail, so he killed this other guy. But he realized that him being free and out of jail for the killing of his wife was not of higher value than the life of the man that he murdered. How do you get a character to realize something like that? Well, that's <laughs> a good question. Development. Yeah. Yes. The point is that every character is a human being, and every human being is living their life, and a life is a series of events that then affect how you respond. So the way that the character responds to the events of his life is informing us about who they are. Because we can't be in their heads, with the rare exception of reading a first-person novel where they dictate to themselves all their feelings. Uh, it's not so rare, actually. <laughs> but um, if we're talking about you know, an episode of a TV show, when you're watching a character sit around and think about what he's done, the point is that something would happen to him. You know, perhaps he's faced with a situation in which he's going to have to kill someone else to continue to live this lie of staying out of jail <coughs> for the death of his wife. And he's looking at himself and he says, my wife trapped me and I thought I had no escape. And now this is going to be my third body. When should I get caught? We're like close to Gone Girl here. <laughs> yeah, like it's one of those things <laughs> where we have to watch him change based on how he understands his world. We can see it on his face. We can see it on the choices he makes. If he lets the third guy go to tell the police about him. He says, I know I'm gonna get caught, I'll try and run instead. That's character development. That has grown from, I can't wait to kill this person, to I have to kill this person to stay out of jail, to if I kill this person, I'll stay out of jail, but I choose not to. There's an evolution going on there in that character, that's character development, and that is creating somebody who we see has a soul, has a moral compass, and is learning about themselves and about how the world works and about who they want to be and that's what makes them redeemable and what makes them likable even though they committed crimes and they're they should probably most definitely be going to jail for those crimes i was going to change characters on this but oh real quick can i throw in something there? go for it the other common trope then would be to kill yourself oh yeah yeah <laughs> that's really common in stories to, to have the realization that i've become this horrible monster I don't like it, so I end up I can't live this stopping way myself by, you know, <laughs> killing myself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change characters to a, now I'm talking about a TV show versus a book series. Elmore Letters, Justified. In that show, you've got two main characters throughout the whole thing. You've got Raylan Gibbons, but you also have um, Bill Bo uh, Boyd. Boyd is a character who, you, you watch, if you ever watch the show, he was part of the organized crime, he's, a, he's gone around, he's committed murder, he actually shoots with a rocket launcher a church that's actually selling marijuana um, and blows it up. He is, starts, the first time you run into him, he is a white supremacist Nazi. 
detect that clearly. He really doesn't believe what he's preaching, but it's how he controls things. But he's got a code. He ends up helping out the, out the marshal ever so often. He goes to jail. He comes out of jail being a preacher. And he's trying to be create a road to redemption that Jennifer was talking about earlier. But the crime and the families, are, everything around him keeps dragging him back. I won't tell you everything he goes through. But he is constantly being going to, oh, looks like he's going to be ready. No, he falls down. I think that makes it a compelling. Yeah, and I want to make the point also that this character that you've outlined, the mm. character that this actually is about, you know, it's telling a story. Mm -hmm. And the whole point it. of a character, of a plot, of a setting, of this conversation we're having, right. is telling a story, a story that your audience wants to see the end of. Mm -hmm. I think her and you. Um, I was going to say, based on the examples we've had, and uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, which was mentioned earlier, who was mentioned earlier, rather, it sounds like you can have an unlikable character, an unlikable protagonist, but in order to redeem them, you have to have some sort of external force or external event that triggers an internal change in how they see themselves in the world. Because with Ebenezer Scrooge, it took like the the ghosts of Christmas, past, present, future, and, and his dead go his dead partner, his dead partner <laughs> Jacob Marley, right. to help him to see that the life he was living currently was going to end in a certain way, mm -hmm. and unless he changed his behavior in the present, that would be his future, and that was a future he realized he didn't want. Mm -hmm. So that made him change his outlook on everyone and everything. Well, so, he was taken down a path to further understand himself and why he came to be the way he was. Because before all this stuff happened in Christmas Carol, he liked the way he was. Yeah. He made those choices and he kept his routine because it was what made him feel safe, happy, and contented. And then he's or taken he's in control. In, he was taken back to the past to show how you used to be. And then he was shown what steps led you to where you are. Then he's shown what you're missing out on. And then he's shown how you will inevitably end up if you keep going the way you are going. And all of a sudden he says, I understand myself now. I understand the world and how I fit into the world. I don't like this ending, but I don't like who I am currently as well. You know, when he wakes up on Christmas morning, he is elated that he can change. Not, oh, thank goodness I don't die alone. You know, he doesn't know that yet. He might still die alone. But he has a chance to say, oh, I don't have to be that miser any longer. I'm going to go do good things and give my money away and make sure that that family I saw through that window with the sick kid gets the Christmas that they deserve. And I'm never going back to where I was before because he's got a, an understanding now we've watched him learn. I think a lot of, it, this happens to heroes too, but especially for uh, gray or even black protagonists, you experience, they experience uh, karmic payback. And a lot of them just internally realize at some point it's like, maybe I deserve this. And I think in t whatever religion people are, I think a lot of people just on a deep level believe in karma, or at least believe karma is right, you know, that bad like, people should be punished. As human beings, we like justice. Yeah. We like things to feel even. Yeah, 007's Jaws. He found love. Yep. That's yeah. how he turned around. <laughs> <laughs> well, he lived for something else. Yeah. Besides terror. <laughs> I want to... Go ahead. I want to reel you into this conversation a little more. Bob. He's so, talking about, she's talking uh -huh. about Bob. <laughs> so, you have a character that sounds like he's a stalker. Yeah, in the, in the, the in the in the novel. Yeah, well, yeah, he's harassing the the gal that he's in, that, that the main character is interviewing for a story. So he he sounds unlikable, like a jerk, or mm -hmm. unlikable for the purposes of this episode. How would you redeem him? What could make him change? And it doesn't unless have to be how he did change. Yeah, yeah, it's like unless that's part of the book that you don't want to spoil. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a good but story. like taking this character. Not necessarily in the same story, but like, how would you, if he was the main character, and I'm assuming it's a he. That, that's um, true. Assuming. Yeah, so, let's assume that, sure. Right, <laughs> so, assuming this character, who is now a dude, mm -hmm. 
is the main character of your story, how do you redeem someone like that who who's stalking mm-hmm. someone? Yeah, well, I guess, well, since the, the identity of the person is not revealed until the end, and then there's interaction with the villain. It's a dude named Katarina who's 20. Yeah, so it's 600 years old and yes. looks like a 29 year old. Yeah. Kind of and is a stalker. How would, yeah. you, how would you do that? <laughs> I guess you'd have to, I guess in that case, yeah, I'd be able to find out to rewrite uh, this character reappeared like in a different story or, or, or whatever. I was to re- re- rewrite it, you'd have to have some interaction with the person. They'd have to reveal what motivated them to become evil and chase the person mm-hmm. in, the, in the first place, and then through some sort of experience they would have a realization that that, that was the wrong path and I mean if you find out what their motives are like, like a lot of the things that were said today was borrowing from <laughs> oh they were visited by Christmas past <laughs> <laughs> there we go case <laughs> solved <laughs> uh, the ghost of a dead friend took his yeah. hand, looked him in the eye, yeah. and said, "You're a terrible person." Exactly. And we don't need things. therapy; we just need ghosts. No, I <laughs> love ghosts. Oh my goodness! They only ever mean well. Yes, this, this is like a horror episode. Like a will tell you. <laughs> and I, I guess see that. <laughs> on that note alone, we will end this episode of Bright Pack Radio. I think we've got content to do other villain esque episodes <laughs> oh. in the future for certain. I think so as well. In that case, have a great week writing, and tune in next week for yet another interesting tale in the writing industry. See you in the daycare. (laughs) Next week on Right Pack Radio, the Right Pack will explore dealing with our demons. Have you written an audio play? Have you ever thought about it? Well, Winding Trails Media is currently open for script submissions. Please visit www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. You can locate that information under the Call for Scripts hyperlink. And thank you for listening. Did you know that Right Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books, your book services, your author services, or more? Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.